Welcome inside our TCS studios. I'm Shay Pepler, and the first round of the 2013 NFL Draft is in the book. So I'm joined now by NFL veterans Jason McKee and Sean Salisbury and NationalFootballPost.com scouting director Russ Landy. And guys, four of the first seven picks in the draft were offensive linemen. There were actually nine taken overall. Russ, let's start with you here. Do you think this is a trend we're going to see continue, or is this just an odd year? I really think it's a trend. I think when you look at the NFL guys, I mean, you really see that it's a passing league now. If you can't throw the ball effectively, you have no chance. You can't win with the old three yards and a cloud of dust. So you have to get guys who can protect the quarterback or else he's going to get knocked out. You're going to be on your backup and you're losing. That's a great point, Russ. And, you know, guys, when you think about a team that will be first and goal, on the four-yard line, and they'll empty the backfield and play with four wides and, and run the back out for motion change, right? in a gun at the three-yard line. So while we want to be physical and get after it, finesse right now when it comes to the passing game has become the name of the game. But the one guy or the five guys you want that don't want to play the finesse game but can are those big fellas up front. So I, whether it's a trend this year, I think always the safest pick in the draft for me, if I'm a general manager, is to get that lineman you can pencil in for 10 or 12 years. Or even if you get a guy somewhere else, bam, you can put him in there and he plays. Yep. It's not as risky as the skilled position. It also tells me in this draft that the skilled position players are average at best. That's exactly why we went big fellas, defense, a lot of that. But a lot of linemen, as Shea mentioned, nine of them. That means guys are building their teams from the inside out. I think it's going to be a trend that continues in this league because when you look at all the elite quarterbacks that are throwing the ball 30 and 40 times a game, Everybody wants a copycat there. So everybody's out there trying to find that new franchise quarterback. And the only way you're going to protect the franchise quarterback is drafting a solid offensive lineman. And as we've seen, there's a bunch of good guys in this draft. Fundamentally sound. And they're, and they're well coached. And I think they'll continue to be developed in college. Because in college, a lot of offenses are spread offenses. And a lot of quarterbacks hey, are throwing the ball just like they are. Started to filter down to high school now. And all these seven on sevens. In, in, in Texas, it used to be run the wishbone. Now in high schools, forget the wishbone. They don't know how to run it. They're lining up in the gun. They don't have to take a snap under center. One other thing, guys, let's not forget. Money matters. And when you're paying your quarterbacks $25 million a year, $120 million contract, 50, 60 of it guaranteed, you darn well better protect your commodity. And the only guys that protect it are the guys that are big and like to eat. So yeah, I don't no mind question. it. And it's a safe pick, Shay. Give us something else. Well, let's talk about quarterbacks now, guys. And E.J. Manuel was actually the first and only quarterback taken in the first round. That's Florida State's quarterback. So, guys, were you surprised by this? And I'll start with the quarterback in the group here. Sean, what do you think? Yeah, the undrafted quarterback in the group. <laughs> um, I, you know what? I, surprised, yes. Now, and, and Russ, you know this, and Jay, you know this, great potential. When you look at all the guys in the draft, and I hate the word upside, it's overused, but it really is one of those guys that you see. It reminds me of a North Carolina basketball player. Think back when Sam Perkins and Antoine Jamison and Vince Carter and Michael Jordan, 14 points a game, 18 points a game, 17 points a game. They never erupted. They get to the NBA and bam, Sam's shooting three-pointers. Mike's averaging 30. Go around. And it's the same thing at Florida State. Here's a quarterback. It's kind of, you know, they run the ball, they play defense, they got athletes. He doesn't have to throw it 40 times a game. They see him in the offseason, works out, and all of a sudden, big, strong, can run. And then you see his real potential. And it's the only sport I know that in the offseason without pads on, your stock can rise and EJ Manuel's stock rose. And there's a little conspiracy going on for me, guys. How does a guy who really wasn't in people's top five end up in New York with his name on the back of a jersey? Don't think for one second he didn't know that he was being taken in the first round while everybody else has got their head in their hands and Gino's wondering what in the world happened here. Great talent. We'll find out if he can survive in Buffalo and they can build around him. I'm going to say shocked because at that position, your head coach, Doug Marone, is the head coach of Buffalo. You need a quarterback. And, hey, I thought he was going to go with this guy, Ryan Nassib, a guy who got him the job at Buffalo, playing so well at Syracuse. So I'm shocked that Ryan Nassib wasn't the pick there and E.J. Manuel was the pick. Well, I think what you see is I think that tells you Marone sees Nassib as maybe a good quarterback, but he may not have the big arm necessary to survive in Buffalo. Buffalo's a windy city, and that stadium is a tough place to play in the cold weather when it's windy. Manuel's got a big league arm. He gets rid of the ball fast, and he's a good athlete, so they can run that option that a lot of teams are trying to run now. He can do all that. NASA may not be able to do it in that environment. Guys, you know we're in, we're in, a, we're in a new era. We're, we're, we, while we still got the guys who will stand in the pocket, the Bradys and the Mannings and that, but we got guys now that can stand in the pocket and the Andrew Lux and RG3s that can still beat you out on the perimeter and run and mix in the option. And in Buffalo, it's but playing in Buffalo, and I've done it, and trust me, it ain't fun. But I can tell you this, you throw that ball, and if you don't have a powerful arm, it'll come back to you. 
like a boomerang. So it's it's an interesting pick, but also I think they see that they can build around. If Kevin Cobb's not careful, E.J. Manuel will be starting by the end of preseason. The only issue I have with E.J. Manuel is consistency. We've seen he struggled with that at Florida State. And another issue, playing down there in the warm weather at Florida State, going up to the in Buffalo, Buffalo frigid temperatures. We played there before yes. shot. Can he do it in Buffalo? He, it remains to be seen. He better know how to wear a turtleneck and put a glove on one of those hands, Shay. Well, guys, this is only the, only the third quarterback Buffalo has ever selected in the first round. But there weren't many offensive weapons taken in that first round. In fact, this is the first time since 1963 no running back was taken in the first round. So, J Mac, I'm going to start with you here. What does this say, basically, about the running back position? Basically says that the position is devalued. There's not a high emphasis on, you know, running backs being drafted in the top 10. We've seen a few win last year, but when you look at the quality of running backs coming out this year, they feel like, hey, we can get by with not having a guy in the top 10 and getting a guy maybe, you know, the next day in the draft. So, like we said, it's a passing league. Most teams are usually one running back. If, if he's not a back that can, that can kept, uh, be a receiving running back or being able to run the ball effectively between the tackles, then, hey, we don't need them. One-dimensional backs aren't going anymore. You find them later. You know, I find it interesting, too. Unless you're getting Earl Campbell or Adrian Peterson or Barry Sanders, which are can't-miss no-brainers. You're saying, well, you know what? I don't need them. I can go free agency, whatever I do. And Mike Shanahan's had unbelievable luck doing that. And then you see the examples like Alfred Morris. Go out and rush for, what, 16, 1,700 yards. Like, who's this dude? Yep. We, he, we didn't draft him in the first round, and it's becoming more like that. And the irony for me is here we are in a league that's passing more, but when it gets right down to it, in January, late December, January, February, you better be able to knock somebody in the mouth yep, and grab them around to. the throat. Yep. You better be able to do it. And if you can't do that, then physical usually beats finesse late. It all looks pretty during the season. And here we are devaluing, and it's the most devalued position. You look around now, heck, tight end yep. with nose tackle are far more important no in the draft question. than a running back oh, is. Yeah. Yet when you want to win and the game's on the line, what do those guys do? Yep, they yeah. want a guy in the backfield who can tote it for them. So yep. there's a lot of irony here, but if you can get a guy some other time or from some other team or in the offseason, you don't need to give a guy unless he dresses in a phone booth and wears number 28 in Minnesota. Other than that, they can go find somebody else. Give me the quarterback and the lineman. Well, I'll beat you more than you'll well, beat but me. Think about it this way. What team other than Minnesota says, here's the ball 25 times a game? Just about none of them. Wait, so. Unless it's a two or trio or two or three backs. Right. It's, yeah, it's, always, it's exactly right. It's always, a, one yep. guy. Yep. it's always a running back by, by committee. committee now. So it's if like it's a said. committee, do you take a committee back in the first right. round? No, no heck you no. Think, you, yeah. take a, you, better be a, you better be a full-grown man yeah, if you're going to exactly. take his running back That's in the first exactly round. It. And yeah. so, you know, you grab a bunch of different guys. But if you're in Minnesota, you're, you're saying, we, we got a pretty good stud back here. We're just going to ponder, just complete eight a game, man, and we'll go win. There's not many of those guys out there anymore, J-Mac. That's exactly it. That's the reason. Yep, Shay. Well, guys, let's switch gears now and talk about Alabama. It's now been five straight years that that Crimson Tide squad has produced a top ten pick. So, guys, this is kind of a two-part question. First of all, does this say more about Nick Saban's recruiting process or more about Nick Saban as a coach? And also, do you foresee any college football program really matching this feat in the near future? Sean, what do you think? Well, I I know that my trophy matched it for a while, and I sure as heck wasn't one of them, but I, I, they can. You know, when you look at the SEC and the dominance and, and now with the, the, the Big 12, there's some great players and great athletes. you got to get a little lucky in recruiting. they got to stay for the time they're there, and they got to dominate and stay away from injury to do it. Um, so will it happen as often as happened in Alabama again? I mean, it's cyclical, but I don't. it may happen and continue to happen right there in Tuscaloosa. Now, get to the point, guys, when you talk about Nick Saban in the recruiting process or the development. I think it's both. I think this guy is without question, and it's not close to the best coach in college football. And not only, he'll even admit and say, I may not be the best coach when he got the job in Alabama. I think it was Mal Moore, the AD, said, I may not be the best coach because that's how he was introduced, but I am the best recruiter on the planet. And that's what he does. And when he recruits them, he doesn't stop recruiting them. He develops them and develops them. And I think the great coaches in this league take ordinary and make it extraordinary or take an eight and make him a ten. Yep. And Nick Saban's better than anybody on the planet doing it at that level. And it will continue. I'll promise you, next year, there'll be another top ten pick in Alabama. This trend won't continue or it won't stop in uh, Tuscaloosa. It'll continue, guys. Well, Saban runs his program uh, like an NFL team. Yes. And when you look at the quality of guys that he has, every year you have a guy that comes out, a corner, linebacker, whatever, skill position guy, they're fundamentally sound. And they're spending time with these kids, not only just like you said, Sean, recruiting these kids, but they're spending time developing these kids in the first round draft right. picks. I think that's why there's such a love affair with the NFL in Alabama right now. Well, I think it's that, and I think you also have to look at, you talk about the recruiting and the coaching, they're able to take kids that may not really be great NFL players but they coach them so well, they're so fundamentally sound that they play at a higher level and often get drafted higher than they probably should because Nick and his staff do such a great job of coaching them. A lot of these guys don't turn out to be superstars. They become solid, workmanlike guys. 
because they're so well coached. When they get to the NFL, there's not much more you can do with them. You can't teach them fundamentals. You're not going to make them better athletes. They sort of are what they are, but they're so good in college, they're going to get drafted high. And you have a great foundation to work from because if you're Nick Saban, you get the best players from high school. Yes, exactly. And the best players continue to develop. They don't, they don't tail off. They get better. And if you're an NFL guy, like Bill Belichick loves Urban Myers players. He loves yep. them because they're smart and they're fundamentally sound. Yep. So if you're an NFL GM and you say, man, I'm on the bubble. Do I take the Southern Cal guy or the Alabama guy or the Tennessee guy or the Alabama guy? What are you doing? I say, yep. well, I'm going go to I'm gonna go with what I know, yep. the guy who's going to show up and be ready to play from day one because he's prepared, and that's Nick Saban's yep. guys. This, I'll be shocked if this doesn't continue into the next decade. I mean, I, agree it, with it, it, I think he is yep. that good as long as he stays there. And if he goes somewhere else, guess what? They're going to have that run of five or six guys yeah. at another school. No question. We're, we're, okay. mainly, we're mainly talking about just the physical aspect yes. of Nick Saban. So we got to talk about the mental aspect of his players because when you look at it, every game has national championship implications down at Alabama. And I think Nick Saban does a good job he having his players mentally, tough. mentally yep. prepared. And no I think question. The NFL scouts and NFL team would like that because these kids thrive under pressure situations, and that's all that's going to, they're going to be involved in at the next level and, in the NFL. And they don't mess it up twice. And you know what, yep. Nick Saban, as he heard him say, it's a process. It's the, we, we, it's the process, and guess what? Nobody works the process better than anybody in America than Nick Saban. And we're going to stay in the SEC now. There were 12 players taken in the first round from the SEC. The Big Ten only had one player in round one. Does this really tell the story of these two conferences, Jay Max? Yeah, it really does. I mean, the SEC is the, the best conference in college football. Like we always say, it's the third best conference in the world. You have the, the NFC, the AFC, and the SEC. No and when you look at it, the SEC players are more pro-ready than, than the Big Ten players. The Big yep. Ten players are uh, classified as being slow. Yep. And it shows in bowl games, too. They get oh, their yeah. really kicked most yep. of the time by the SEC well, team. Well, the SEC exactly. gets these elite athletes. And when you look at the, every position, they have speed and explosiveness. You go to the Big Ten, you might find one guy in A.J. Jenkins every few years. But generally, they're more fundamentally sound, sort of under-control athletes that aren't great players. They just find a way to get the most out of their ability. The SEC, you get both. You get guys who are fundamentally sound, well-coached, who happen to be world-class athletes. So I think this difference is going to last forever because what kid from Florida, California, or Texas is going to say, yeah, I want to go play at Iowa City, Iowa, as opposed to going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, yeah. or, or to uh, Georgia? I mean, it just, it's just hard to matters. get those yep. kids up there. And, and you know what's interesting, guys, is when you – when you think about it, let's just face facts. Let's call it like we see it. The Big Ten was sorry this year. Very, oh, sorry. And you know what? Extremely. And they looked at it. Sorry competition. The, 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 the players couldn't match up. And guess what? We'll take one. Yep. Now, the SEC, there's no bye week in the SEC. No. There is no bye week when you're lining up. Even Mississippi State's with Dan Mullen and, and Miss. I mean, you're, you're lining up, and you better be a full-grown man and suck it up and have the guts of a burglar every doggone week. And if you don't, you got no shot to survive in that conference. Without question, it's not. Matter of fact, I'm not so sure, given the cyclical part of it, that it's not AFC one year, SEC <laughs> then NFC or vice versa. <laughs> so right. this is a special conference with the best players and the best players in the world. You don't need to test them at the combine. When you go watch film on the SEC players, guess what? You know what you're going to get. Well, because they're playing against That's other. Exactly. NFL players. It's but solid, that's, but but that's thing, exactly but right. But we're failing to realize, realize is you're getting the best players, but you also have some of the best coaches that yep. are in the SEC no as question. well. No question, and that's so what makes it a so perfect it's a match. Win. You, take, we, you we, take a supreme athlete, you, you, he's being coached by one of the best coaches in, in college football, it turns into a first You got the guys like Kirby down. Smart, yep. defensive coordinators, all when Will Muschamp was at Texas and now is the head coach Kevin in the Sutherland. SEC. All these assistant guys are now seven-figure guys, and a lot of them are right there in the SEC, and there's a reason for it because they're earning it. This is the best conference in football. And quite frankly, guys, and I'm a Pac-12 guy, it's not close oh, right now. Not even close. Let's talk trades now, guys. The first trade happened rather quickly as the Miami Dolphins moved up nine spots and got that third pick. And they took Oregon's Deion Jordan. Was this a surprise to anyone? What do you think, Russ? You know, it was a bit of a surprise to me because I think most teams looked at Deion Jordan as a guy who fit better in a 3-4 scheme. And to go to a team that's playing a 4-3, I think they're going to have to be a little bit creative. They're going to have to put him in positions to where he can succeed because he's not a big kid. Yes, he's tall, but he's sort of a thin, angular guy. If you put him down and make him a 4-3 end, he's probably going to get smothered and crushed to the ground. So I think you're going to see Miami do a lot of hybrid stuff, a lot of moving guys around because if they don't, I don't think they'll get the value out of Deion Jordan. I'm, I'm not surprised with Deion Jordan going to Miami yeah, and Miami please. trading up because in that conference, you got Tom Brady. You, you need a guy to that has to, to, you have to yes, get to Tom no Brady. Question. If not, you're not, you have no chance of making the playoffs because we know New England, Belichick, Tom Brady equals playoffs. It hasn't equal championships uh, lately, but it equals playoffs. And to get to the playoffs, you got to get Brady. You got to get pressure on Brady. So I can see them making the reach trading up and getting Deion Jordan. Yeah, and all that matters, guys, whether we think it's a reach or not, is the Miami Dolphins love him. No question. And here's how I think they're going to use him early on. And backtrack a little bit. Think about what do we think about when we think about Oregon? 
explosive offense. Points, yep. points, points. Oh, speed, by the way, speed, speed, we're speed. drafting a defensive guy from your school first because of the athleticism. Yep. What do they do in the Pac-12? They throw. Yep. They love to throw, and they love to throw, and they love to throw. Not quite as physical as the SEC, but very, very out there like the Big yep. 12. They'll spread you out and do it. And this kid's great. The, the, the problem is I think they're going to specialize him first. I, think I don't so. think you're yep. going to see him play 70 snaps. No. Now, he's going to start, yep. but you're going to see him on – First Passing down pass downs, rush. Yep. When they're in the gun, spread him out. Move him around to the left side, to the, the defensive left side, so he's not getting manhandled by a 300-pound great left tackle that can get him in his grips. He's one of those guys that needs to play in space. Yep. And when I mean play in space, I don't just mean dropping the pass in pass coverage in the flat. Yep. I'm talking about operating in space with use his speed and dip underneath. And what he needs to do is go to the Dwight Freeney School of, of, of Pass Rushing, get about three or four you different moves and specialize moves. those. Because in this day and age, guys, if he can give me 50 snaps a game and give me a sack a game, I may not need him to play the run as often yep. as he does. I think it's a good pick. Maybe a little early, but you know what? It's only a little early and only, and, and only a reach if the kid doesn't play well. Talk to me in four years, and we'll yep. see if it was a reach. He, he needs to thank Alda Smith for, for getting picked this high. Oh, because no question. Since no Alda question. Smith had similar in San Francisco, yep. similar body types, not the muscular guy, slender guy, has a good get-off, yep. can get around the edge and cause fits for left tackles. I think he needs to give, give Alda Smith a call and say, thanks for getting me turned out, big fella. Turned, turned out pretty well for Alda turned Smith. Well yeah, yeah, I think. It, and the Dolphins guys. They're starting to bring yep, it, man. Well, An impressive offseason. Two they, explosive edge yep, guys. They, they don't even, they're, they're not even blinking and making moves. So the Miami yeah. Dolphins are tired Defense of Tom Brady's better. reign. Defense That's exactly right. Defense got better. Well, Deion Jordan had 44 tackles and five sacks in his senior season at Oregon. Well, guys, now we're going to talk about the burning question. What was the best pick in the first round of the NFL draft? And who do you think has the potential to be the biggest bust out of all these guys? Russ, what do you think? Well, you know, I think the best pick, I really, I'm probably going to go out on a limb here. I really love the Rams going up and trading for Tavon Austin. I think if you feel you can get the most dynamic offensive weapon in the draft, go get him. And I think this guy's going to be a Steve Smith type game changing player. I think he's one of those rare guys that comes along once in a decade. So that's why I love the Rams being aggressive. Don't sit back and hope he gets you. Go get him. Put him in your offense. He will make Bradford a better quarterback from day one, and he will help them win the field position bat battle on special teams from day one, which makes them a better team. And, and J-Mac, it ought to tell you how much Jeff Fisher and St. Louis love Tavon Austin and cherish what Sam Bradford's gone through in his first two years. It's really made chicken salad out of chicken dump. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there hadn't been a whole lot going on for them. So what Austin does for a defensive head coach, Jeff's tired of having his defensive guys on the field. Now it gives him a guy who can move the chains a little bit. It does. I, I'm going to go with Chance Warmack, uh, drafted by ten, the Tennessee Titans. I love this guy, Alabama. We see what he did to Matt Titel. He's the reason why Matt Titel didn't get drafted in the first round. And we look at Chance Warmack. Now you have Chris Johnson. Now you have Sean Green that they added to the mix. He's going to open up a ton of running lanes for those guys. Takes some of the pressure off the quarterback there. And I think he brings an added dimension and a bit of nastiness to the Tennessee Titans offense that was much needed. Guys, I'm going to go with Notre Dame tie. I'm going to go with Eifert. And I'm going to tell you why. And I, and I think the Bears had a chance here. Now, I know they went out and got some, some tight ends in the offseason, but tight ends, this is the most in vogue position in the NFL right now. The premium on quarterbacks, pass rushers, and left tackles, add a fourth one. Yep, it's the I tight end, the ability not to have to substitute. Yep, it's not to change again. You, you dog on mismatch. right. You take your tight end, you move him to wide receiver. You take your tight end, Aaron Hernandez, and stick him in the backfield. And nowadays, we don't just want one, yep. we want two. Now, he goes to Cincinnati. And, and the pick, what, right after the Chicago Bears, right? You know, Cutler wants more weapons. Well, Andy Dalton got a weapon. And yep. you got a guy who can run. you got a guy who can flex out. And along with Gresham, now you're playing against the Ravens and the Pittsburgh yep. Steelers who have those nasty defenses, zone blitz, all the things that they do. And you're Andy Dalton. He's got another weapon. Now what do you do? See, if you go big, meaning a tight ends, keep two tight ends in the game and go big, what's the defense got to do? They, they want to match up and go yep. big. Well, if you're playing linebackers or safeties on those tight ends, they run right by you down yes, the middle match. and score. Yep. Now, match. if you're going to go small and you're putting corners, a nickel and dime set, and you're putting corners over those big tight ends, then we're going to hand the ball off and run it right down your throat. I think it's a tremendous advantage, and I'm not so sure that the tight end position, forget the four wides and spreading out, I'm not so sure the tight end position has not completely changed this game. And when you got those guys that can run and block, I think this is a steal of a pick. I think the kids got Pro Bowl potential, and I think the Cincinnati Bengals are going to give the Steelers, the Do I mean the Steelers and the and the Ravens and everybody in the AFC all they can handle. Don't be shocked if they well, win that division next year. This. He's got 60, have, 70 catches. Now you have Eifert going to pull the defense up. Yes. Imagine what A.J. Green is going to do now. I mean, he's going to be able to run by the defense. He's going to score long touchdowns regularly because they're going to be so concerned about the underneath passing game with the guy Who's like Who's going to double? Who's picking yeah, poison? Exactly. That's, That's right. Poison. That's exactly you're, you're what gonna, it is. You're going to yep. take A.J. Green or you're going to take uh, Jermaine Gresham. And guys, you got Eifert in the mix, too. So. I know I know. that you know, there's a lot of good combos tied in wide receiver. But when you talk about young combinations, including a quarterback yeah. who I think is tough as it yep. gets, Andy Dalton. Red rifle. With A.J. Green and Eifert. 
Is there a better inside, outside, young combination with that quarterback in the league? No. Keep an eye on that group. Yeah. They'll be at some point in, this, in their NFL careers when Eifert, Dalton, and A.J. Green are all playing in Honolulu, if not late in the playoffs and possibly down the stretch. I like this football team. It's about time that that dark cloud's not hanging over their head. No question. Well, Tyler Eifert, really, you guys all like him. You forgot to talk about Bus. You were just on Tyler, Tyler Eifert's Bus. Oh, we got Bus. That's right. <laughs> well, that's right. So who I'm, wants to start with Bus? I, I'm going to take, take Barkevius Mingo. And I know we talked about, you know, a lot of guys, defensive ends getting drafted now with similar body types from Deion Jordan because of the success Alvin Smith had there at San Francisco last year. But I'm looking at Barkevius Mingo. I think he only had four sacks last year. He's a guy that, that wasn't, didn't test well on the bench press at the combine. Now you're saying, Sean, we talked about it before. The combine has no relevance in, in the game of football. Looks it's good but, in a pair of shorts, though, good in a pair of shorts. <laughs> but I want to know what happens when he gets engulfed by these big left tackles. Can he disengage? We yep. know he can get around the edge, but is he yep. strong enough to disengage? That's the big is thing. he strong enough to play the run for that man? Yep. Because we, as we know, Sean, offense in this league will scheme you. They will run the ball right at for key this yep. And if they do that, he's going to be a one-dimensional player. They could be a potential And one-dimensional guys rarely survive. They yeah. actually have to be situational for him, they survive players. For a minute. Yeah, exactly. But, I, I, I agree in a lot of respects with Mingo, but the guy I'm going to take is Kyle Long, the guy that the uh, Bears took in the first round. This kid that didn't even start a full season, Division One college, he's a very good athlete, but I don't think you see the consistency from him that you want. I think he primarily got drafted because he had such a great week at the Senior Bowl that teams sort of fell in love with the what could be because he's a long That big P kid, word, right, Russ? Potential, potential word, yep, right. yeah. And it's a risky thing. To me, potential is great if you've got a guy that started three years and you can say, wow, he's gotten better every year. He could be this. But a guy who started a handful of games and bounced around in his college career, to me, that screams failure in the NFL when you're a first-round pick because he's not going to get a year or two to sit like we were talking right, about. He's, he's start. starting he this right year. Now. He's a and starter. If, and if he starts getting whipped, How's he going to handle that upstairs? That's not easy for a rookie to handle. See, guys, for me, when you're drafted somebody, and, and when, whether they're training quarterbacks and you train running backs, the, the number one trait, everybody says accuracy for a quarterback. I said, no, I can fix a guy's accuracy mechanics. What I can't fix is physical, mental, and emotional toughness. And if you don't got it, you'll be out of the league in a hurry. I'm going with Ezekiel Ansaw, who is the guy from BYU who excites me the most but also scares me the most. Lions take him with a fifth pick. they got some really good inside players that can hold the line of scrimmage. Yes. But this is a kid who gets in a wide nine. Yep. And, 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 and if you do that and you've got three guys defending up front, yep. you better have some stout inside linebackers that people can't get to their legs. No question. Now, if you want a pass rusher, and you open, good luck guys trying to block yep. this fool because yep. he's out of his mind good. Yep. And the potential's through the roof. Exactly. He could be in the Pro Bowl for 10 yep. years or he but could be out of the league in three. Exactly. That's exactly right. You so you're do. really playing with 10 guys inside in the yep. run game. But the, the, the potential, that, that word again, but he's so athletic and so good. So the question is, which guy shows up? Is it a guy, again, that we specialize and leave him in for just pass rushing? But if you're the fifth pick of the draft, guys, i got to have you on the yep. field 60, yep. 75 snaps a game yep. because you're going to get paid like it. So the question with him is, can he handle that every snap, every day? And if he can, then this will be not only, not, not only a great pick, an amazing pick, but if he can't, this is a guy who gets physical out of the league in a hurry. Remember, he went to school to be a basketball player, yep. got cut from the team at BYU. Exactly. And did you see his frames, guys? This is what I love about it. Yep. You see the frames of glasses had the 3D logo like oh, you yeah, get at yeah. the movie theater? Yep. Now, I don't know if those 3D lenses were in, but that's a new nickname for him. Yep. Who doesn't want to have the nickname 3D? Yep. I'm, giving, I'm labeling right, him now 3D, coming at you from all angles and right in your face. But He'll be fine, I, I but think, he could be a bust. I think the biggest investment with Ezekiel Ansa is going to be his position coach. Because if, if his position coach can bring the best out of him, can teach him the game, because like you said, Sean, he hasn't played the game for a while. His, if his position coach can bring that potential up out of him, I think he'll can be never a great get comfortable. Yep. And be I, a great to pick. me, the scariest part, though, is I remember seeing him at the Senior Bowl. Day one, the Lions coaches, they coached him. So you had a feeling they might draft him, but they lined him up wide. He was dynamic. The next two days, they put him down like a traditional defensive end. He was a non-factor for two days of practice. He got dominated by anybody he went against. To me, that's a red flag because that says if you have to make him a one-spot wide guy, that's going to alter everything you do. It's going to make it easier to block him over time because people are going to figure out all he can do is come off the edge. So that, to me, is a big red flag to his success. Well, you get to the point where you just motion a receiver and chip him. Yep, all you need to chip exactly. a little bit and yep. get up inside right. and dip inside. So it is a risk. I mean, it's a fun risk. Yes. And we know Detroit's taken some risks at wide receiver in the past, so not, why not try this? I think it's interesting. But if he comes up and that defense inside and that front seven can be stout, and you better get to the Aaron Rodgers of the world and guys like that. It's going to be fun. But you don't want to play Minnesota with Adrian Peterson and be and in a wide nine. Wide. It's exactly. going to be, then he'll yep. rush for 340 yards and rush for 2,500 when the season's yep. over. But I think that we like these guys, but the potential to be a bust when you got a guy that high is out there, Shay. All right, Ezekiel Ansaw, no longer Ziggy. We're calling him 3D here. That's it from our <laughs> TCS studios. For Sean Salisbury, Jason McKee, and Russ Landy, I'm Shay Pepler. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.